something a little bit different this morning after we get things started. Um, next week, I don't know if you've heard this thing that's coming up next week. It's called Easter. You ever heard of that? Resurrection Sunday. And uh, we, we, the choir is going to be doing um, a musical uh, called We Are Witnesses. And at one point, I've just um, decided, Alice and I talked about it, and I've decided I want you guys to sing with us. So this morning, I'm going to teach you a song. And you're gonna, we're going to get to be in like a choir rehearsal. So we're going to have a great big old choir, and you're going to be part of that choir for that. And we'll, we'll teach you that song here in just a moment. So, But before we get that started, let me welcome you to our service. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the worship pastor. I'm Sean Crane. I've been a uh, worship pastor here for about 10 years now. And the Lord is blessed, truly blessed. Uh, through this church. This is a great, great, wonderful family to be a part of. And uh, if you're our guest this morning, we want you to know that you are very, very welcome and that we are very thankful that you are here and that you are an answer to our prayers. We have been praying for guests to come to be a part of our service and um, God laid it on your heart to be here today and in so doing he answered our prayers and you're, you're that answer. We, we thank you for being here this morning. If you have not stopped by the Connect desk, please do that. Uh, we have a, a gift there if this is your first time with us and we would like to get you know, just a little information from you uh, just so we can uh, send you a letter saying thank you for being here and uh, also you can pick up that, that thank you gift at the Connect desk. If you have an offering this morning you'd like to give, there's an offering uh, box down here. There's also one in the foyer. You can drop that in either one of those locations or you can give online through our website um, which is centerforkbaptist.org. Uh, if you're a guest and you haven't registered you can also register online uh, through that. There's a QR code should be in front of you in the pew. You can scan that QR code it will take you to our guest registry on our website. You can also give there. You can also give uh, just by bringing uh, by the church office during the week if you'd like to do that. All right we're going to start things off with Psalm chapter 27. And uh, there's actually several verses out of here. It's verses 1 through 3, verse 5, and verse 14, just kind of an excerpt from Psalm 27. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we get to be together to worship you, to lift your name on high, to learn of you, to hear your word, Lord, and to experience you as you worship with us and through us in this service. Lord, help us to do everything that we can uh, to lift your name and honor you today. And Lord, I pray for those that are on our hearts. You know each need and each situation, and we just lift them up to you and pray that you would have your will in each life and that you would show your name great. Lord, I pray for everything we do now to be glorifying to you, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we get to the part where I'm not going to make you stand up yet. You're going you're to learn a new song. Uh, next week, at the end of a song called Hosanna, I'm going to have you join with us. So that means all of you who are here have to be back next week so that you can help everybody that's not here this week, that will be here next week, learn how to sing it, yeah? So that's, that's the way that works. Not really, but okay. Um, this song goes, it's very simple. It's Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to the Holy One. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Really simple and easy. Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to the Holy One. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed is... So we're going to sing that with the piano. And is that coming through on there? Good. All right. We're going to sing that. And, and the choir is going to lead you in it. Choir, you can stand up so the mics will pick you up. Good. And they know this. Lori's going to play the choir parts, and you're going to sing along. You sing the melody with me, and, uh, and we'll sing it together. Here we go. Ready? Got it, Lori? Get us in the right key. Here we go. And let's sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to the Holy One. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now sing Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to the Holy One. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name. Now we're going to do it up to speed and sing it together. Okay, now you can stand up and sing it. Here we go. Hosanna. Let's, let me get back to the beginning. Here we go. One, two, three, four, one. Hosanna. Hosanna. Glory to the Holy One. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna. Glory. So next week, okay, you're going to be ready, and, and those that come next week that weren't here this week are going to be looking around at y'all going, how do they know this song? I've never heard this song. So yeah, you'll, you'll have something up on them, and don't tell them. Just let them be confused. It'll be great. It'll be our secret, okay? Yeah, it'll be good. All right, as soon as we get everybody in place, we got everybody in place, I think. I love this song. It's Whom Shall I Fear? It's the God of Angel Armies. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? Let's sing together. You hear me when I call. You are my morning darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Who shall I be? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Who shall
that the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of angel armies, God Almighty is on our side. And actually what it is, he lets us be on his side. That's the way it really works. We get to be on his side, and we get to do that because of the grace and the love of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross and the fact that he conquered sin, death, and hell on the cross and that he rose from the dead and he lives forever. And that's what we're singing about this whole season is because we, we don't have to fear because Jesus died. He covered all our sins in that death. He rose from the dead. And now he's conquered sin, he's conquered death, he's conquered hell, he's conquered all our fear. And we get to be on his side as he is there for us. And what a sweet, blessed, wonderful thing that is. How sweet it is to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Lori, take off, let's sing. Tis so sweet. We'll sing three verses, first, second, last. I think that's what I put up there. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the same the Lord. Jesus, sees us how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, sees us pray. confess the bowing here I find my rest because without you I fall apart you Lord are the one who guides my heart
gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford.
you'll never stop us. We are warriors. When we fall down, we'll get stronger. You'll never stop me. I'm a warrior. When I fall down, I get stronger. Faith is my shield. Love is the Thank you, Rania. That's awesome. Hey, two become one. That's biblical. You got to put their names together and everything. I'm just, I'm just being, I'm just being biblical. They're a great team uh, in their home and in our church. Thankful for them. Thank you for that song. Uh, a couple of announcements before we jump into John chapter 20, so you can, you can get there, you see it on the screen. We're going to deal with the subject of fear and the empty tomb today. Uh, a couple of announcements. So if you have your uh, bulletin, let me remind you what some of the weekly statistics mean, just so that you kind of know what's going on. Uh, if you're not sure what these numbers mean, I want to just buzz through those real quick. We go over these in detail in our members' meetings when we look at our monthly reports, but uh, I want to... I wanna explain these. I don't think I need to explain the, explain the left side, our AM worship attendance. That's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, our total offering is, is all of the offerings we receive for that week, uh, and some of that, of course, is designated sometimes, and that's why you see a second amount under general treasury. So just understand general treasury is our budget. That's what we spend out of to do ministry, pay salaries, do all of the, all of the work that God's called us to do. And then our weekly budget, that's actually our weekly budget as it relates to our budget number, our budget needs. So if you see in that, in that box, if it's plus, and there's no negative, that means we got more than we needed that week. You with me? So last week, in fact, the last two weeks, we've, we've been above budget, which is great, because if you look at year to date, we are, look at the next column. So YTD means year to date. So all of our offerings as it relates to budget, we're, we're down about 9,000. But that's a whole lot better than being down 25000 which is where we were about three weeks ago. So praise the Lord. In fact, basically, the, the, the year-to-date budget deficit is due to the fact that we had to close down two weeks for COVID. And those two weeks of missing offerings, we got some offerings, but not nearly what we normally get. Um, and so that's, that's, what that, that's where that, in fact, you take that, those two weeks out, the fact the whole month of January out, we've, we've actually had a really good uh, February and March and also as we've begun April. So if you ever have questions about our finances, whether you're a member or an attender, uh, all you have to do is ask. I'm going to say that again because Brother Sean nailed it, okay? But he's on staff. It doesn't count if he gets it, right? If you ever have questions about our finances, you can ask. ask. All right, so if you're on our finance team, if you're on our finance team, I need you to stand up. I don't know how many of our finance team members are here. So if you're on our finance team, Renee's up there. Chris, our sound man right there in the blues. Just stay standing. And you may have to wave your hands. Alan and Brother Steve, anybody else? So you can not only ask me, you can also ask one of these folks about our finances. They'd be happy to, to take the question. They may be able to answer it. If they can't answer it, they'll get the answer for you. And uh, we're thankful for them. In fact, we're going to be meeting this week, right? Yeah, hey, all right, uh, Tuesday night. Also, uh, under principal reduction, if you're not familiar with what we're doing there, you may be new to Center Fork, you may not realize, you know, we built a building back in 09, 010, this multi-purpose building. I always get turned around. Where is it from where I'm standing? It's over there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Susan. Like, it's somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where, but it's somewhere. Uh, we, we've uh, been working on that debt, and that debt is now below $300,000. That's what that middle balance means. And so, that, yeah, that's, that's worthy of, of a thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. In fact, it's even lower than that now because we've already made probably another payment and another PRC payment, but we haven't gotten that record from the, the bank yet. And uh, so that's what that information is all about there on 
on the front. And again, if you have questions, ask them. Also, don't forget deacons. We have a meeting today at 4. And uh, they're helping uh, in a lot of different ways. One of the things they're helping me with right now is we're going through our membership directory trying to find the sheep. And, uh, and we're going to need your help with some of, some of these folks because we have people that are listed as members in our church family in our, you know, technically on our membership role, but we don't know where they are. And we're having trouble with some even knowing who some of them are. And so we're, we've been working on that in the deacon team meeting. Sean and I went through about 200 names this week ourselves with Gina's help and sent out cards to everyone that we could think of that had a good address and and invited them to our Easter services. So don't forget that. And then also Wednesday night we are having a a, kind of a, 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 a special service in preparation for Easter. It's in the bulletin. There on the back, it's just an Easter prayer service. It's going to begin in here at 615. So no, no men's and women's Bible study that evening. We're going to meet in here together. So our men's and women's Bible studies that meet every week would like to invite you to an Easter prayer service. We're going to meet in here. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to prepare ourselves for Easter and also pray about our Easter services coming up on Sunday. So well, what, what are we going to be doing? You don't need to know. Just show up. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be good. Uh, we'll open the Bible. We'll pray together. We'll read together. There might be a devotional or sermonette. Who knows? Uh, it's, it's going to be a big surprise. So just come at 615 right here in the uh, sanctuary. Okay, John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 19 through 23. Let's pray, and then let's uh, jump into our, the text. Father, we do want to stop, pause, and just take a breath and focus our hearts and minds on your word and ask you to speak through your written word Through your preached word, we pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit. Uh, We pray pray for your Holy Spirit to convict us, to teach us. Uh, Lord, where there's frustration or maybe unwillingness, Lord, break us. Where there's sadness and uh, just hopelessness, Father, fill us with the hope of your your gospel and your good news. Uh, Father, help us to come to a place of joy by the end of this service, where we can uh, bury all of these things at the foot of your cross and at this empty tomb. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Every single one of us deal with fear in one form or another. And sometimes anger is actually, underneath anger is actually fear. A lot of times the things that you get angry about, there's actually an underlying fear that you're wrestling with that you don't realize. Uh, I've, I've, as the Lord has worked in my life, I've, I've found out that, oh, I'm not, really, I'm not really angry. I'm just afraid of losing something, and it manifests as anger. And all of us, in some way or another, deal with fear. I mean, we're such skittish creatures. We have a dictionary full of phobias, full of fears. I mean, we make them up, right? I mean, uh, you, you just go on, uh, go, <laughs> Google it. Uh, if you, <laughs> you can have a fear of anything, a fear of short, dumpy preachers. Yep, that's probably in there, okay? <laughs> Maybe that's why you know, some people are reluctant to come back. Uh, there's fear of snakes, fear of water, um, a fear of people. This is always a weird one, a fear of clowns. That's actually justified because they're kind of spooky sometimes. You know, when you put a clown in the wrong place, a clown in the wrong place, context kind of weird and a little goofy right so there's there's a lot of fears that all of us deal with and some of our fears let's just admit are irrational right and you know it like you and I know it when we have that conversation with ourselves we say things like this I know I shouldn't be afraid of but I am okay I want to make sure you understand something as we come to John chapter 20 The fear that gripped the heart of these apostles and this early church was not irrational. It wasn't a made-up phobia. It was real. Because there was a real threat. It wasn't a conspiracy theory anymore. They weren't just out to get Jesus. They got him. Somehow, they infiltrated This close-knit apostolic band, those 12 men, somehow they got inside the apostles to the point that even at the Passover, before before he instituted the Lord's Supper, and you you know the whole story, while they're sitting there, Jesus is having this kind of side conversation, looking and also talking to Judas, because he knows what Judas is going to do, right? 
But the apostles, the other apostles had no clue it was coming. And that must have shattered them. When, when, the, when, when they're in the garden and Jesus says, rise up, let us be going, and they're coming to take me. The, the, the prince of darkness is coming for me. Here they come. It must have shocked them when the betrayer kisses Jesus on the cheek. And then they watched him be arrested. And then, of course, they fled. They watched those Jewish leaders arrest the famously popular Jesus in the night and convict him in a kangaroo court. And somehow they convinced a pagan ruler who hated the Jews and hated living in Palestine, hated being in Galilee, to brutalize and kill him on a cross. So when these men, and, and also if there are more disciples beyond these apostles in that upper room, and they're afraid, they're afraid for good reason. Because the one who picked people up out of death and leprosy and restored them to life was brutalized and put on a cross in front of them. So that's what they were facing. This room on the first evening was filled with fear, paranoia, and probably hopelessness. And unfortunately, here we are 2,000 years later, and we know better. But unfortunately, our churches, and sometimes our lives, are like that upper room. We've got the doors locked, and we're afraid of what's out there. Well, it's time to bury that fear at the empty tomb. Let's read our text. Verse 19 says, Then the same day at evening. So this is Easter evening, right? Sunday night. So, you know, this is the first Sunday night service. You with me? <laughs> they didn't plan for it to be. They were actually just having a closed door, how are we going to get through this weekend, how are we going to get through this week kind of, kind of meeting. Being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, and he tells us, for fear of the Jews, not all the Jews generally, but the Jews who arrested and took Jesus and brutalized and then handed him over to Pilate. Jesus came and stood in the midst, in the middle of them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Now let's just admit, that would scare you. Don't act like if you were there, you would have been, oh yeah, I expected this, Jesus to show up in the middle of this room. No, they're afraid, they're scared, and when they see Jesus, they're not immediately at peace. That's why he has to say it twice in this passage. <laughs> because they weren't at peace, even with the resurrected Jesus, because they were still trying to make sense of this. So he stands in the middle of them and he says, peace be with you, shalom. <laughs> and when he had said this, the Gospel of Luke gives us a fuller, fuller details. He showed them his hands and his side. And then Luke tells us that he actually ate in their presence, right? And then it says, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So just about the time you're getting You've had two, two commands of peace, right? And then Jesus says, okay, guys, guess what? The Father sent me. I'm sending you. Well, what happened? <laughs> this passage is clear that Jesus can show up anywhere at any time. He wants to. So I'm not going to make any more comments on that uh, door slam other than that. Other than to say if Jesus wants to show up in the middle of this room, he could. <laughs> right? I did not plan for that, by the way. <laughs> not that smart. So Jesus says, I'm going to send you just like the Father sent me. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. 
If you retain the sins, or that is, you refuse to forgive the sins of any, they are retained. So as we look at this text, I want to I want to tell you that first of all, we can bury our fears in the empty tomb because first of all, we have Jesus. Look at verses 19 and 20. And I just want you to see these verbs, and I want you to see what Jesus did as they as he was just dealing with their fear. This is uh, you would you know we would call this a pretty significant trauma to see someone brutalized and killed and murdered like he was, and that's exactly what Peter calls his death from a human perspective in the book of Acts. This was a brutal and horrific way to die. And they watched all of that happen. And then Jesus is miraculously, instantaneously, standing in the middle of the room. And so Jesus does this. First of all, it says Jesus came. Jesus showed up. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because why? You are what? So Jesus shows up in the middle of our fears. He's there. You may not feel like he's there. That's not what he says. Peace be to you, feel good. (laughs) No, it's a command to receive the peace of God in this moment. Jesus comes in the middle of our fears. And in fact, uh, (laughs) as you think about that slammed door, one author pointed pointed out the obvious but helpful fact as you think about this upper room, this locked door. They wanted to keep the outside world out, right? They were afraid and fearful, but it didn't make a difference to Jesus. He can show up anywhere at any time that he chooses. And thankfully, he shows up in your life when you are afraid. Secondly, it says that Jesus stood. Jesus came and stood in the middle of them, stood in the midst, not in the midst, but in the midst, in the middle of the room, in the middle of these people. I'm just going to stop right here for a second. Maybe one of the reasons you're so afraid is because you have abandoned being with God's people on Sunday so often that you never experience Jesus showing up in the middle of your fears. Because you know where Jesus shows up on Sunday? Right here in the middle of this place as we gather around his word and worship his name. This is why Thomas, and we're going to talk about Thomas in a couple of weeks, Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas is going to refuse to believe in the resurrection for a whole nother week. For whatever reason, he wasn't there. We don't know why. But Jesus came and stood. Now think about what's happened. Judas betrayed him. The Jews rejected him. Pilate executed. Death laid him in the tomb for three days later. But after all of that, Jesus was standing. This world... Judas, the Jews, Satan, death, hell, you name it, all of it was thrown at Jesus. And at the end of that, he just stood. Same Jesus today. But he doesn't understand our problems. Oh, give me a break. He doesn't understand our culture, how ungodly our culture is. Oh, give me a break. Study history. Look at first century Roman and Jewish culture in that region. Trust me, he understands all of that. And after all of those things, you throw whatever you want to from our culture at Jesus, he's still standing. Okay? But Jesus not just coming and standing in their midst, he also spoke. Now, this is important because dead men don't talk. Dead men... Don't inspire movements that turn the world right side up. Dead men don't give speeches that people get motivated by to go give their lives for a specific purpose. Dead men don't talk. Now, through technology, it's kind of weird. You can have someone speak at their own funeral. I mean, it's a blessing, but it's also kind of... But that person isn't speaking presently, not here on earth, right? Right? Jesus in his resurrected body is speaking. Speaking. And and by the way, (laughs) as as he's showing them his scars, if he didn't resurrect and he just resuscitated, which is one of the silliest myths that atheists sometimes put out, that Jesus just kind of fell asleep, how many people would want to be in the same room with someone who just went through a bloody crucifixion, who didn't really resurrect and didn't have real, a real glorified body. Who would want to give their lives for that kind of Jesus? 
Like he could say whatever he wanted to, but if he had scabs and he was still hunched over and still in a lot of pain and he, he hadn't really resurrected, do you think Peter and James and John, do you think Mary and all of those women, do you think the early church would have taken the gospel to the ends of the earth unless when they saw Jesus, they saw him in a glorified state, standing and speaking in a glorified body, perfected? Because that's what he does next. He speaks, he also showed them. Because at this point, they weren't convinced. So he showed them to convince them who he was and what he said he would do. He convinced them that he was alive. And he had told them over and over in his ministry, uh, at, at near the end of his ministry, really about that last year, maybe the last uh, you know, three quarters of that last year, he told them he was going to be handed over to the Jews. And the Jews would hand him over to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles would hand him over to crucifixion. And he would die, but then three days later he would rise and Jesus is standing in their midst, in the middle of them, in the middle of that room, showing them. Now you may be here this morning, and you may be afraid that some of the sins you've hidden from everybody else are going to hunt you down and put you to death. Because we're all here, I'm wearing my nice, you know, my Sunday clothes. You don't know everything there is to know about me. You don't know my whole past. You don't even know all of my present, and I don't know yours. And maybe here, you're here this morning, you're wondering, did Je- does Jesus really forgive me? Does Jesus really love me? Did his death really affect reconciliation and forgiveness and, of God for the wrath of God? I mean, if you're living your life in constant fear that maybe God's just going to have enough and cast me into hell, you don't understand what Jesus is doing. He's saying, look, it's paid in full. I conquered it. I bore wrath. I bore sin's wrath. I bore God's wrath for you. Here's here's the payment. It's paid in full. It's okay. I I survived. (laughs) That's what he's saying. Listen, one of the reasons why you can come to the empty tomb and you can bury your fear is because we have Jesus. And I don't mean Jesus as a thought. I'm talking about a real person with a resurrected, glorified body Someone we can follow, someone we can love, someone we can believe in, someone we can trust, someone who saves us and keeps on saving us, someone who forgives us and keeps on forgiving us. Because every time I come to him with my sin now, he still would take me back to the scars and said, okay, I understand you're broken, I understand you've sinned, and I'm not happy with it, but I paid for them. Right? We have Jesus. I live in constant fear and anxiety. You can come to the empty tomb, come to his pierced side, see his scarred hands, and you can bury fear. We also have peace. In verses 19 and 21, he says it twice, and peace here is, of course, the equivalent of the Old Testament, I mean, Aramaic uh, greeting of shalom. And, but this is more than a greeting. This isn't, just, this isn't Jesus just saying, Hi, guys. Now, this is rich with theological meaning. In the Old Testament, to to have the peace of God is to have the wholeness of God, to have all the blessing that God would have you to have, to flourish spiritually, emotionally, and physically in every sense of the word. That's what shalom means. It means a wholeness of life, a wholeness of blessing that God wants to bless his people with. That's why when he created Adam and Eve in the garden, he blessed them and gave them dominion over that garden, right? He blessed them. That's shalom. He blessed them as they procreated and had children. He blessed all of those things, right? So we have Jesus here giving peace to his people. And listen, this is an important thing to understand. These disciples were being controlled by fear because they had forgotten what Jesus taught them. Look back at John chapter 14, just a few pages. Now, I want you to turn there so you can read it for yourself as I read it. This is the upper room, John 14 through 16 where Jesus is teaching them about this very subject. He says in verse 27, Peace I leave with you. Now what he's implying by that is that the interim period between his death and his resurrection, they could have experienced peace. But instead... They embraced fear. Just like today. 
We can live in constant fear and anxiety about everything that could possibly ever go wrong in our lives. Or we can learn how to walk in faith, trusting in God who didn't just save us from our sins, he's saving us forever. We have the same choice today. Now, does, does, will Jesus ultimately save those who are fearful? Sure. But you're going to waste your whole life worrying about things that probably will never happen when you could be enjoying peace. Because peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit that lives in you, right? So it's a gift of the Lord. It's also something we're supposed to pursue. So it's two-sided. It's a gift that God gives us to enable us to pursue it. And it is a birthright of every single child of God in the middle of all of the mess, in the middle of all the possible things that we could be afraid of, we can experience peace. My peace, I leave you. My peace, I give to you. So it's a gift of grace. Now listen to these words. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be what? Neither let it be what? Hmm. He goes on. You've heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you will rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father and my Father is greater than I. And I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. They didn't believe. They were afraid when they could have been at peace. Look at chapter 16. Look at chapter 16, verses 25 through 33. This is, this, is the, this is the last paragraph that John records of the upper room. And I want you to see this because this is so powerful. <laughs> I love this interchange. Verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. So Jesus is saying in chapters 14 and 15, I've used a lot of metaphor, a lot of analogy, and, and I've been rather figurative with some of these things throughout the last, but, but now the time is coming when I will no longer speak in figurative language, but I will t- tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that, you, that uh, I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came, now listen to this. I came forth from the Father, and have come into the world. So pre-existence, eternal God, Jesus the Son, right? I came forth from the Father. I have come into the world, incarnation. And they believe that. Again, I leave the world, he's talking about ascension here, and go to the Father. And his disciples said, oh, see, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. But by this we believe that you came forth from God. And then Jesus said, do you really believe that? Are you sure about that? Because I think something else is getting ready to happen. And listen to what he says. Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have, say it out loud. In the world, you will have tribulation. And Jesus is getting ready to send them into the world, into trouble. <laughs> but be of good cheer. Why? I'm standing in the middle of the room because I have overcome the world. I can give you peace because I overcame the world. You mean he's not going to, you know, ex- extract me from this situation? No. Here's the miracle. He's going to leave you there, lead you through it. And ask you to believe him, trust him, and walk with him, and obey him, and experience peace. And it's a peace that the world won't understand. It's a peace that the world did not give you. It's a peace you can't earn and work for. It is a peace that only the Lord Jesus Christ, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, can give us. Now, as you look at verses 19 and 21 of our text, this peace, and I I don't want to belabor this, but I want you to see that the first peace that he offers is really a peace that conquers the fear of death. When you look at verse 19, what he's talking about there is, you know, he, he's shown up in the middle and he's trying to convince them that he's alive. This is, this is a peace that he offers so that you can live your entire life without being afraid of death. Now, I'm not talking about being stupid and foolish about death, but Jesus is saying, we 
no longer have to ever live in fear dying and death. The rest of the world doesn't have that. The rest of the world, you know what the rest of the world does about death and dying? They act like it never happens. They never talk about it. They try not to think about it because if they thought about it very long, it would depress them and probably paralyze them with fear. This is also a piece that conquers the fear of going. In verse 21, I want you to notice the context of this piece and the context of this. This is a great commission passage. Jesus is getting ready to send them. Well, where is he sending them? He's sending them, you know, to the church down the street because that's where the people that agree with them. Oh, wait, there's no church down the street. Right? There's some synagogues down the street, but they don't agree with Jesus. <laughs> uh, there's the Roman world. That sound inviting? Jesus is going to send them into the world. The Father sent Jesus, Jesus sends us, and we have his peace as our companion. So we need to unlock the door and bury our fear in his empty tomb because we have his peace. We also have the Holy Spirit. Verse 22 is one of the five great commission passages of the New Testament. If you're not familiar with those passages and what they signify, it's important that we, we, we put this verse in its proper context with the other four Gospels and the book of Acts. And here, here's the importance. So Jesus resurrected from the dead and then appeared to his apostles, his early church, and to individuals over a 40-day period. Can everybody give me an amen? Okay. And then they waited 10 days and the day of Pentecost came. Pentecost being 50 days from Passover. Pentecost, get it, right? So in that 40 days, Jesus appeared and Matthew records a great commission of the church and what we're supposed to be doing. Because remember, at the end of 40 days, where did Jesus go? Back to heaven. And he promised to send his Holy Spirit to take his place and to do his work and expand his work. So Matthew gives us a great commission passage in Matthew 28. Mark gives us a great commission passage in Mark 16. Luke gives us a great commission passage in Luke 24 that should be read with Acts chapter 1 because they're one and the same. It's a two-volume work written by the same author, Luke and Acts. And he gives another great commission passage that is very similar to this one in Acts 1, 8, and 9. And then we have John's great commission passage, which is really just a verse. As the Father has sent me, I am. I'm sending you. And right on the heels, right after he gives this commission of sending them, he breathes on them and commands them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now before, we, before you start trying to, you know, what exactly does this signify? Let me just go ahead and tell you, we are not sure exactly what this signifies. Okay? We are sure about this that the Great Commission is motivated and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God that Jesus gave his church. And that's what's pictured and symbolized here. I'm sending you and I'm breathing on you the Holy Spirit, receive him. Now, the 120 aren't in this room, so the rest of the church isn't there. Thomas isn't there. And also, um, there doesn't appear to be any difference or change in the apostles or the disciples after this event prior to the day of Pentecost. That's why when we look at this passage, I think it's best to understand this passage as a preview of Pentecost and what Jesus was going to give them because they were afraid. He was going back to heaven and they knew they were going to be sent out and Jesus gives them a preview. Look, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. You're going to have the Spirit that filled me at my baptism and carried me my entire ministry for that work. You're going to have the Holy Spirit who's going to replace me and expand my work among you. And in fact, Jesus even tells us, and I can't go there, that it's good that he goes away. Because Jesus says a man can only be in one place. But Jesus, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, can be in every Christian and in every church simultaneously doing work around the world right now. That's what this, I believe, is a picture of. And it's also something that Jesus had already promised. Just, just again, sometimes the Bible explains itself if, you just, if we just let it. Look at John 14, verse 16. 
Back up to John 14, verse 16. Now, in this passage, it's Jesus giving the Holy Spirit, right? And in this passage, it says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. So the Father is giving the Holy Spirit to his people. So which is it, Jesus or the Father? The answer is yes. Both persons of uh, the, the, fir- the first and second person of the Holy Trinity are giving the Holy Spirit to the people of God, to the church. It says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. I'm going back to heaven. The Holy Spirit is here permanently. That's good news. And he says, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you. So prior to Pentecost, this work of the Holy Spirit specifically that Jesus is talking about, Jesus did that work. Post-Pentecost, instead of it being an outside job done by Jesus, it's gonna be an inside job done by the Holy Spirit among his churches. For he dwells with you and will be, now look at this, he will be in you. I will not leave you like orphans. You are the children of God. You've been bought and paid for at a price. And I'm gonna give you the spirit of God to go with you as you go into the world. Now I don't have time to detail all the, all the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the individual believers, you know, before you get saved, after you get saved, sanctification. I don't have time to go into the ways in which the Holy Spirit works among the church because this, this, one is, this passage is focused really on one really singular thing that the Holy Spirit does. And what the Holy Spirit does is he gives us the power to be witnesses. That's what this commission is all about. I'm sending you like God has sent me, and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit as you go. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's the commission in Acts. That's our commission. Well, how in the world could a bunch of people, a bunch of Gentiles, living 2,000 years later, separated from the the Holy Land by six or 7,000 miles, be a witness on this earth to the living Christ? I will tell you how. Because he has given us the Spirit, and we have him question is does he have us does he have you and does he have this church do we exist for the purposes of the spirit in this great commission well that's a whole nother sermon now how do we know that these folks really received the holy spirit so in the upper room they were afraid all right well just go over to the book of acts with me don't miss this this is maybe one of the richest parts of the, just to see what happens after the day of Pentecost. And I could use example after example. Turn to the book of Acts. We're going to refer to four passages in here. Look at Acts chapter 3. This is after the day of Pentecost and thousands have been saved. Peter and John go to the temple in Acts 3. They heal a man. Remember? How many of y'all remember the song? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give by thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Something like that, right? Did they get close? Okay, close. (laughs) Well, they didn't just get close with this healing. They raised this man up, and it gathered a crowd in verse 11. Now, as as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, (laughs) Peter's... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like there's this Peter and John are trying to walk around the temple and there's this dude just like <laughs> he can get up and walk himself but it's like I'm not letting go of you guys I can just imagine and that would create a spectacle and it says they were greatly amazed right verse 12 says so when Peter saw it so all these people are coming they're coming to Peter there's a crowd coming at Peter There's a crowd coming at John. The last time this happened, (laughs) or before Pentecost, before the crucifixion, when the crowd came, Peter ran. Peter didn't confess Jesus. This time, 
So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God, listen to this sermon. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. You denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you and you killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of which we are what witnesses the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of this church and got a hold of this apostle so they went from fear to incredible clarity and boldness about the resurrection of Jesus we've seen him we've spoken with him we are witnesses well, Acts chapter 4 happens. They, they get arrested. They get released. Uh, and then they get arrested uh, again in, in Acts chapter 4. I mean, they get arrested in Acts chapter 4. And when they're put before, look at verse 7. I want you to know, <laughs> verses 5 and 6, who, who is he standing in front of? Just scan your, scan your Bible and tell me who is he standing in front of. Not just any old group of people. He is standing in front of the people who just a few days, just 50 days earlier had put Jesus to death. (laughs) Okay? That's real fear. If he had run, written a letter and said, here, read this, I'll come back later, we'll see how it works out. Let me give you a tract, I really don't want to have this conversation. (laughs) Here's the gospel, see you later. (laughs) We would all understand that, right? Sorry, Jonathan, I was a little fast. Yeah, I almost ran. Jonathan's our cameraman back there. By what power or by what name have you done this? Verse seven, then Peter, filled with his arrogance and pride, like the night he, no, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Verses 11 and 12, he summarizes, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only the Holy Spirit gives those kinds of words. That's why we don't have to be afraid. We have the Holy Spirit empowering us to be witnesses And I could go on and on. In chapter 4, verses 23 through 31, there's actually a a prayer meeting. They're no longer locked in a room. They're now praying in such a way. And if you look at these verses, they, they had a prayer meeting about Peter and John getting beaten. And they were happy to suffer for Jesus' sake. But if you look down in verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, that is the church, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's the evidence, and they spoke the word of God, how? With boldness. So let's go to the empty tomb, church. And let's bury our fear there. Because we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us permanently, individually, living in us and working through us as a church. Finally, we have forgiveness of sins. I was talking to someone this week about church. And sometimes you have these moments where you, you think clearly. Uh, you know, you, most of the time we're just kind of living life and just trying to get from one thing to the next. And sometimes you, you have these moments of clarity. And you say, well, what exactly does the church have to offer? Do you ever think about that? Well... Here's our thing. We have the good news of Jesus, which is the only guarantee any human being could ever have for the forgiveness of their sins. You can't get that through good works, religion, rational thought. If you don't receive the forgiveness of sins through Jesus and his gospel, you will die in your sins. Not only now, you will die in your sins in an eternity in a lake of fire, in eternal hell, forever. Now, if Jesus' resurrection is true and he can say, Here, here's the payment, look at my side, 
I'm resurrected. I conquered sin, hell, death, and the grave. I absorbed the wrath of God so that you can now have forgiveness. See, here's the thing that frustrates me about myself and about you. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, sheep. You just walk in here, and I just walk in here like, of course God forgave me. Of course he forgave me. Because I'm wonderful. I'm special. No, 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 no. Jesus is special. And it is a wonder upon wonder upon wonder that God would be willing to forgive us and that Jesus would be willing to pay it and that he would be willing to keep us saved and forgiven. I know about you, church. There is nothing on this planet that can offer that to anyone except Jesus. And we have the gospel, the good news. Now, when you look at this verse, and please listen, as I, when I raised my voice, I wasn't yelling at you. I was yelling at us. So I put myself right there by you in the seat. Because I just waltz into God's throne of grace and start talking without even thinking about everything that happened, had to happen for me to do that. Please know my heart on that. Verse 23, it seems, when you read this verse, I mean, right, you just read the verse, verse 23, it seems as if that this verse teaches that God has granted the apostles or the church, okay, institutionally, the local church, or pastors the authority to forgive or to retain sin. Like that, that Jesus Christ has died, but now God has given the authority to forgive sin to the local church, to a pastor, to a priest. Right? Now, there, there are two other passages that are like this one. One is in Matthew chapter 16. The other is in Matthew chapter 18. So, first of all, before you dismiss this, this idea or this notion that really uh, Roman Catholicism, the Orthodox Church... Those branches of Christianity emphasize this, and I think improperly interpret and apply this, so that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the priests are the vicars of Christ, and they and the church are able to give and forgive sin. So if, you, if you're going to get forgiveness in that system, you've got to go to the church. You've got to go to the priest. You have to go through elaborate systems and rituals. And so the question that you need to ask is, does this verse really teach this? And we shouldn't run from this. This is one of the things that I also don't like about us, is that we don't talk honestly about the difficult passages in the Bible, and then we complain that other people are confused by them. <laughs> so what does this verse actually teach? Now, one of the things that you need to remember as we go along this journey through the Bible, and as long as I'm pastor here, I'm going to be teaching the Bible, but also I'm going to be teaching you how to read and study the Bible. Whenever you come to an unclear verse, you always use clear passages to interpret the unclear. When you come to a difficult verse, you always use the easy verses to interpret the hard ones. Always. And also know that no human being is ever going to fully know everything that God has revealed about his will in the Bible. There are some things that we're just going to have to wait until we get to heaven, like explain this verse fully to me. So, how do we know that this verse doesn't teach that? First of all, let me give you some possibilities. First of all, the language. In the Greek language, in verse 23, the phrase, they are forgiven them and also they are retained, is in the perfect passive tense. And here's, the sense, uh, here's a way that could be translated. If you forgive the sins of any, they already stand forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have already been retained. And the idea is that instead of, a, instead of, it, of people on earth being the authority, it actually flips it around. It's that God in heaven does the forgiving, and as we preach the gospel and announce forgiveness, that forgiveness has already happened in heaven. Okay, that's one possibility. The second possibility is that you have to look at this in the, tent, in the, in the context of the commission. This verse is in context of his apostles going out and preaching the gospel, making disciples. Correct? That's what's getting ready to happen in the book of Acts in the letters of Paul. So, we actually do declare forgiveness. 
I mean, we do that. When someone comes to me and, and they say, Brother Scott, I want to have my sins forgiven, and they, ask, and they believe upon Jesus and his resurrection, do you know what I tell them? I don't tell them, eh, well, maybe. Not sure. <laughs> kind of like the <laughs> we kind of answer the way the Supreme Court Justice did about gender. You know, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> you know, I'm not the Trinitarian God. I can't, I can't declare whether. No, I can. We are commanded to preach the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ and call people to repent and to believe in him and to offer the free gift of salvation. That's our commission. That's one of the things we preach. So there is a sense in which we do that. But the easiest way to explain this verse is to ask, okay, so there were some dudes in that room, right? Right? Weren't there some guys in that room? Yeah. So when you come to a difficult verse, you, all you have to do is ask, well, what did Peter think that Jesus meant? What did John think that Jesus meant? Now, John's gospel was written at the earliest 70s. In the 70s, after the temple is destroyed. Possibly as late as 85 or 90 A.D. John's gospel is written well after all of this. After, after all of these events have happened. So when John writes his gospel, and I, I'll just, let me just read some of these to you. So John 1.29, he, he's, he's telling us about the ministry of John the Baptist. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not John the Apostle, Jesus, the Lamb of God, dying and taking away the sin of the world. In John 5, 24, John, who was in the upper room, who heard Jesus give this statement, writes this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. And when you read the Gospel of John... It is over and over and over again where Jesus declares that forgiveness of sins and relationship with God the Father is through him and through him alone. The, the ultimate expression of that is in John 14 where he says, I am the way to the Father, I am the truth of the Father, I am the life of the Father, and no one comes to the Father but through me and the Pope and the church. And No. So we can know from the writings just of John. And you can turn over to 1 John and see that also. Go to the next slide for me. You can go to the, 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 the 1 John chapter 1, 8 uh, through chapter 2, verse 2. But let's look at Peter. So when Peter was preaching the gospel. So Peter was in the room, right? What did Peter understand Jesus to mean? Listen to Peter preaching to Cornelius. So Cornelius was a Roman Gentile who was a God-fearer. He attended Sabbath and, and, and was, was a, a man of good works. He prayed, but he didn't know about Jesus. And so Peter was sent through this vision to go preach to Cornelius. Okay, so listen to what happens in Acts chapter 10, verses 39. We are witnesses of all things. Talking about Jesus and everything that he said and did which he did both in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before God, even to those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Now listen to this, listen to this good news, church. And he commanded us to preach to the people. Well, what are we supposed to preach, Peter? We're supposed to testify that it is he, that Jesus was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission or forgiveness of sins. Do you understand that, church? When you believed upon Jesus and you really received him as Savior, God sent all of your sins away. And he didn't need me to help him. He may need us to preach it. But is it the forgiving? No, that's, that's, that's something the Lord does. What about Paul? Look at just a couple of chapters over in Acts 13. Now, I'm making this point because, folks, this is, this is a dividing 
verse and theological idea among Christians on planet Earth. This isn't a minor thing, okay? I believe, I believe that the Bible has big answers for everyone on planet Earth, not just our little, our little corner of God's kingdom here in ABA world. You need to know where this stuff is at. You need to know if you've got a friend who's enslaved by that religious system, why they can know they can have forgiveness of sins through one mediator, and his name is Jesus. And you don't just need to yell at them, you need to show them. This is what Peter said, this is what John said, and look at what Paul says. Paul's first mission trip, his first sermon in Antioch of Pisidia, verses 38 and 39 at the end of this. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, who's the man? Jesus. Through Jesus is preached to you. What? That's what we're preaching, church. We get to go out into the world, this sin-laden, broken, dark world, and offer the grace and mercy and forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ when we preach and share the gospel. We have God's forgiveness, not only personally to receive, but to preach and to share with the world. And instead of being afraid of the world, we should be broken for them. And not in some type of condescending way, but broken that they haven't experienced full forgiveness of sins. Paul goes on to say, By him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Here's the good news of the empty cross and the empty tomb. We can experience full and complete forgiveness of our sins. We get to believe it, declare it, pronounce it, receive it, enjoy it. So if you're afraid that God isn't going to forgive you, you need to bring that fear and bury it. Bury it at this empty tomb. Jesus died so that you don't have to worry and be fearful about that any more. We have a choice today, church. Do we want to live out our days locked in an upper room, afraid of the world? I mean, it's easy to preach this this morning. I kind of got a little wound up. I mean, let's just admit it. My wife, I think, is in the nursery. She'll see it, and she'll probably say, hey, got a little wound up? Yep, I did. <laughs> she says, if she was in here, she'd be giving me the... <laughs> yeah. 30 years, I know her hand. Then it would be afraid of what might happen, afraid of dying, afraid of failing, afraid of how the world has changed and left us. You ever have those fears? I don't understand the world anymore. I don't understand my own kids or grandkids anymore. I don't understand. I'm afraid of what's out there. I'm afraid of the interwebs and Snapface <laughs> and Facegram. We're afraid of those who disagree with us. Like, we can't have a conversation with somebody who disagrees with us without getting red-faced and yelling at them. And, and, and the reason is not because of our righteousness. It's not, no, it's self-righteousness and it's fear. You're afraid to stand in the presence of someone who disagrees with you and have a conversation because at the root of that, we're afraid of them. But that's not our birthright. Our birthright is to be able to stand in peace with the grace of God and the Spirit of God and boldness and clarity to preach and to share the truth without fear. So we've we've got a choice. We cannot faithfully serve God and fulfill His commission if we're controlled by fear, church. Theologically, we need to bury our fear because Jesus Christ is alive. Don't miss don't miss the obvious part of this text. Okay, this, is, this is about fear, right? Uh, that's what I've been preaching about fear, but, but don't miss the obvious theological things that are going on in this text. Jesus is alive. His tomb is empty and is empty still. Mary, by the time we come to Sunday night, Mary saw him, spoke with him, embraced him. As, as, as he left her, he then appeared to the women on the road right after her. And then the, the Gospels tell us and 1 Corinthians tells us that he met with Peter that afternoon. 
So Peter saw him and experienced him. And then the disciples on the road to Emmaus, sometime that afternoon, they're like, oh, I can just imagine them. It's like, oh, man, it's over. This is all horrible. And then Jesus comes along. It's one of the funniest, I mean, I find it funny, conversations in, in the New Testament where Jesus walks up and says, oh, why are you guys so sad? What's going on? <laughs> And then they run back to Jerusalem after Jesus makes himself known, right? And then these 11, with possibly even more of the disciples in the room, all eyewitnesses of Jesus, who conquered sin, hell, death, and the grave, who absorbed the wrath of God for us, standing in their midst, it says, I know, I know, I know Good Friday was horrible. But we're not living there anymore. <laughs> I'm alive. So why would we want to live there, church? Hmm. Practically, the tomb is still empty. And Jesus, just think about your own life. Think about this church. And I know that we have most of our doors locked while we worship. Okay? That's not, that's not because we're afraid of getting arrested, it's because of some of the security issues, safety issues, right? You understand that, correct? We're being smart. We have some doors open, but we have people that help us with our, our, our safety team. But I want, I want you to think about this metaphorically. Do we want to be a church where the door's locked? See, Jesus wants to open the doors of the church Invite us out of this safe place. Come to his empty tomb and bury our fears there and go into this world with his gospel. So well, where am I going to go? Are you in seventh grade? There. Gym class? There. My college campus? There. Some of you have to go back to a home that is split and divided over Jesus. Guess what? Bust open those doors and go there with the gospel. We have Jesus, we have his peace, we have the Holy Spirit, we have forgiveness of sin. Uh, church, it's time for a funeral. Let's go to the empty tomb and bury fear. It's two things. You may be here this morning and you need to come to the empty tomb and you need to receive what you need to bear your fear. And I'm not in charge of your repentance. I'm not in charge of whether or not you've ever really trusted Christ. Or if you've trusted Christ and you're struggling. I, I'm not in charge of any of that. But here's what I know. Is that Jesus in this moment right now in this room. Is offering you something. But it's up to you to receive it. Behold. His hands his side. Even while I'm speaking, you, you know the Holy Spirit's at work in your mind right now. Come to this empty tomb and receive what you need to bear your fear. Maybe you need a fuller understanding of Jesus. Maybe you need to receive his peace. Maybe you need to call out on and, and try to live in step with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you need to be convinced once and for all of the forgiveness that Jesus offers. I don't know, but you need to receive it. Look, these disciples had a choice. They could either hold on to their fear or they could release it and hold on to Jesus. Now what about you this morning? Secondly, you may be someone in this room that just needs to learn how to rest in what you have been given. Like you don't need to do anything. <laughs> You've got Jesus you have his Holy Spirit. You have his good news. You have his forgiveness. You have his peace. And you just need to learn how to just. Everybody just take a dig deep breath. Everybody take a dig and hold it. And now exhale. You just need to rest. That's your choice. Keep holding on to that fear. Or grab a hold of the resurrected Christ. Why don't you stand with me as we have this invitation. You respond as the Lord leads, as Sean comes and sings.
and leads us. Our Lord, I come. I confess. And bowing here, what? I find my rest. Because without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Let's sing it together. Lord, I need you. When I cannot 